your fees, you need to adjust your fees accordingly. Shelters are going to take you more time, more effort, more thought. Structural fees ought to be higher. If they're not, then you got the wrong structural engineer because they don't understand what they're getting into. You're going to have peer review fees or the owner may have peer review fees. You might be asked to assist on uh, securing funding through FEMA. Let me tell you, I don't know how Illinois is. Kansas, it's about a 16-page document. Missouri is about a 100-page document. That's, a, that's about a week's worth of time. Solid time just to put that information together to see if you can get secure funding from FEMA. It's time. What do we sell? Um, and the lack of those fees should not be an excuse. I'm telling you, I've seen people that didn't adjust their fees and consequently, you know, when it pushed come to foot shove, they said, hey, I just don't have time to mess with it. I don't have the fees to mess with it. And that may cost somebody their life. Don't do that. You got to understand the golden rule of tornado shelters. If you don't understand this, then for heaven's sakes, don't do shelters. Continuous load path. Continuous load path is kind of like the old dim bone song for you older folks. You know, the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone's connected to the shin bone. Same concept. You're trying to basically take loads that are imposed on anything that's above ground and you're trying to get them down into the ground. Those loads, don't, this, this example is just uplift. Those loads also work in this direction, they work in this direction, they work in this direction, they work in this direction. Triaxial loading. Masonry code, for you, those that are up on the masonry code, says you don't have to deal with triaxial loading. Guess what? Tornado shelters, you gotta, you got to deal with triaxial loading. It's happening. Tornadoes just don't give you a nice horizontal wind when they hit. We don't know what happens, quite frankly. We don't understand why a tornado can hit one house and right next to it, house is unharmed. And I mean unharmed. No windows broken, no nothing. We don't understand that. Nobody understands that. You may have a wall that's doing this, doing this. Tell me triaxial loading doesn't apply. It does. Your structural needs to understand that. No continuous load path. This was a duck, or a, a, not a duck, sorry. Eight kids died right here. Eight high school kids in Enterprise, Alabama died seeking shelter where they were told to seek shelter in that building. There's absolutely no vertical reinforcement in that wall. Absolutely none. Did it require it? No. Was it a shelter? Hell no. It wasn't. And it cost eight kids their lives. Another continuous load path issue. When I talk about continuous load path, we are talking details. We're talking, in this case, this is a, this is a shelter door with a, a shelter hardware device. And you see that there's a shim back there behind that. It's hard to see with the, with the lights on, but there, sorry. But there's no shim behind here, and there was supposed to be. Anybody look for shims behind stuff like that when you're out in the field doing a punch list? I'm sorry to say that this was one of my jobs, and I didn't catch it until I had my door supplier and hardware writer come out and do a punch for me on that. And he said, you're missing the shim. It's about continuous load path. 
It's about the screws, down to the screws that are holding the hinges to the frame and the door. Don't believe me? They tested some, some screws from overseas, had a slightly different bugle head on them, and when they tested them with the protocol, they failed. You look at that screw, and unless you could compare it, you'd have no idea. I have no idea, but that's the detail that we're talking about here. You lose the door, you don't have a shelter. It's that simple. If you don't have shelter experience, for the love of God, find somebody to help you. It's time to put your pride away. I don't know what it is about, and I'm going to include myself, us as architects and engineers, I don't know whether it's pride, I don't know whether it's ego, I don't know what it is, but because you got a 361 in your hand and the ICC 500 in your hand, doesn't mean you know how to design a shelter. You know what the outcome is supposed to be, but you don't know how to get there. Find some help. Please find some help. Make sure that your engineers, if they're not experienced, have them find some help. We're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about making them ducks. Get them to get, and for God's sakes, don't get your buddy down the street that's never done a shelter to help you with a peer review that a shelter that you've never done. And say, hey, you know, I'll scratch your, you scratch mine, and we'll all be happy. No, you won't. You won't. Get them in early. It's a lot easier to change stuff early. I have so many people come to me at 95% say, hey, I need a peer review. Okay? Just did one in, Oklahoma, in Moore, Oklahoma here a month or so ago. 95% said, hey, need a peer review on this. Two-story shelter, classroom addition, 13 classrooms, toilets, corridors. They were 6,000 square feet short of where they needed to be because they, the, they calculated the occupancy factors wrong. How do you explain that to your client? Oh yeah, you know, you got about a third of the school that's going to have to stand outside the shelter because there's not enough room. Whoops. Whoops. Haven't seen, that was our initial review, you haven't seen the, the outcome of that yet. But we're going to do a final review on it, patiently waiting. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't like telling people that. That's bad. Doesn't make them look good at all. Makes me look like the bad guy. I didn't do it, I just pointed out that pff, you missed it. And this is the big one. You gotta understand that your shelter occupants can't afford any design mistakes. Day in and day out, that shelter, if you make a mistake, may not ever, ever expose itself. But it will expose itself at the exact moment that those shelter occupants need that shelter the most. The exact moment. And then it's too late. It's too late. Simple as that. This is a detail given to me. Said, hey, would you take a look at this, see what you think? Initially looked at, okay, you got fully reinforced masonry wall. You got filled Build cores on a hollow core slab roof, which is kind of weird. I spent five minutes. Well, they got a clear story window. They put a shutter on that window. And in five minutes, here's what I found. You know, they broke the golden rule. Don't have continuous load path. That's a huge problem. This was a disaster. An absolute disaster. It was, there was 12 of those two weeks before school was supposed to start and this building was supposed to open. $420,000 claim by the contractor to fix this mess. Five minutes on the phone with this guy and I could point him in the right direction, would have been no problem. And his fix was, the, was what I would have told him that he should be doing. But he decided to get cute, didn't understand how this stuff works, didn't understand that you can't turn a shutter sideways, 
which he has in this case. The hardware has to run by gravity, and gravity, at least in Kansas, doesn't run this way. Evidently, it did wherever he was at. This is a huge mistake. Huge mistake. The guy doesn't do shelters anymore, by the way. He said there's no money in it. <laughs> yeah. Need to be aware of claims. There's, there's all kinds of manufacturers out there doing doors, they're doing windows, they're doing hardware, they're doing um, shelters themselves. You need to understand, when they say it's storm resistant, is that a hurricane or is that a tornado? Is that a thunderstorm? Those are all storms, right? You need to understand, ask them what their proto testing protocol was. What do you mean by storm? Oh, we meet the ICC 500. Okay, what version? Two versions out there. And for doors and windows, they're dramatically different. In that, you have to test the maximum size and minimum size. In the 2008, we thought, well, you, you test the maximum size, then you can do anything below, size-wise, do anything below that. What the door manufacturers found out was the smaller that those doors get, they lose their elasticity. And now they have a tendency to, to shear, the missiles shear, because they don't have that give, and they failed. Whew. Got manufacturers out there saying, you know what, we can do, we tested a 7.0 by 12 foot, and we can go down to one by one. BS. BS. You got to understand what that testing protocol is. For tornadoes, 15 pound 2 by 4 at 100 miles an hour. You want to see the test reports. Ask for the test reports. If you never use their product, ask for the test reports. If they say that's proprietary, go find something else. Why? Because they're hiding something from you. I'm telling you, they're hiding something from you. Don't accept that. And don't chance it. You can't afford to chance it because they want to sell you a product. Verify. Here's one of those internet things, so forgive me for being a little bit fuzzy. This is a page out of a test report for an aluminum door, all glass, full light. Tested four times, it was a pair of them, tested four times. Missile weight, 15 pounds, okay. Each test, greater than 100 miles an hour, okay. Observations, missile hit target, pushed the glazing to the interior an inch and a half. An inch and a half, what's the thickness of a door? pushed it in an inch and a half. That's a huge flag. Secondly, missile hit target, knocked one end of the panic on the left side to the interior four and a half inches. There's a picture of it. It knocked the panic device off. The panic device that latches the door, that keeps the door shut, it knocked it off. And here's what's scary. The testing agency said it passed. You got to be kidding me. The testing agency said all we were looking for was missile penetration. Well, believe me, when the panic device gets knocked off and the door opens up, there's going to be some penetration. This is a testing agency. This is a third party testing agency that wrote this report. Don't, don't go there. Don't do that. Do your homework. Don't take their word for it. Do not do that. This is bad. This is horrible. Can't believe it that we got testing agency out there selling you guys all a bill of goods. Somebody's going to die that uses those doors in a tornado. It's awful. 
utilize their manufacturer's tested assemblies only. Okay? They go and test a window that's 3-4 by 3-4. That's the only thing they test. That's the only thing you use. Don't let them tell you that I tested this 3-4 by 3-4 panel and you can make a whole wall out of it. No, you can use a 3 bar 4 by 3 4 panel. Understand that. There's storefront guys out there that says, I can do an entire wall of storefront that will meet tornado shelter, or for, for tornado shelter. No, I can't. Don't do this. Here's an architect who said, well, I want, I want these doors, I want glass in them, and they got to be FEMA 361. They don't exist. It don't exist. So don't do that. This happens to be a precast shelter in Missouri. Somebody said, hey, would you take a look at that? What do you think? There's a problem. Anybody see the problem? The highest wind loads are in the corner of a shelter. The highest wind loads. It's zone five for structural engineers. It's the highest. The worst is where the roof meets the corner. That's the absolute worst. In this case, they put doors right in the corner, pairs of doors, right in the very corner, in zone five, which may be okay. Did they verify that whatever the structural engineer says the load will be in that corner, did they verify that the doors pressure that was tested on those doors exceeded what the structural engineer come up with. You got to verify that stuff. If not, get them out of the corners. Get them to a location that they have, that they will withstand that. This may not be wrong, but it throws up a big flag. Louvers, two manufacturers out there making louvers. You know, they say you can put a louver on the exterior of a, of a shelter wall. It may stop the big debris, but as you can imagine in a tornado, it's picking up tiny shards of glass and sand and all that stuff that may stay in the airstream and never hit, hit these blades of this shelter. This particular one, they got big gaps at the top and the bottom. I don't know what they're thinking on that particular manufacturer. They stop the big stuff, but they won't stop the little stuff. Sandblasting is a phenomenon in a shelter. This column was painted that color. That's all because of sandblasting. It's a pea gravel parking lot just down the block from this building. It just took every bit of paint off that. You don't want to take the skin off of a child that's sitting on the other side of that, that uh, louver. Design multi-use shelters not single-use shelters because Louis Kahn said that shelters want to be something else. You get the best bang for the buck, you're going to use it for something else a lot more than you're going to use it for a shelter. Be careful of the prefab prefabricated community shelters. Do your homework if you're going to use them. Some of them make a lot of claims that aren't true. Here's one in Joplin, Missouri. I call it the Easy Bake Oven. It's a single-use shelter has no HVAC, natural ventilation only. Can't imagine what it's like there in the middle of May when it's 95 degrees outside and about 45, 50% humidity. It's gotta be stifling. Separated from the host building, that's a problem. And look at all the stuff around it. Here's a, here's a little wood shed uh, on skids. Here's a wood frame pre-engineered, or a, a, a temporary classroom building, all wood frame. Here's a rooftop unit up here. Here's a parapet, looks like it's about ready to fall off as it is. And here's a great big metal building on the other side. Has these nice 16 inch wide razor blades on the walls and the roof. And this is the part that, that I really like. That's the bathroom. That's Mr. Bucket right there. Really? That doesn't comply. Is that ADA accessible, for crying out loud? 
Needless to say, all the other issues associated with it. Don't be caught in that stuff. Here's another one. Same manufacturer went into an existing building, pre-engineered building, had masonry walls on either side, and they basically dug out the floor, poured a mat foundation in there, and basically put their shelter inside this corridor inside an existing building. 200 bucks a foot it costs to do this. And it doesn't comply. No bathrooms, no ventilation, no fire separation. And boy, they were touting this as a cat's meow. Don't get caught. And my, my favorite. It's a tornado shelter with wheels. It rolls on wheels. Wheels. Tornado shelter and wheels should never be used in the same sentence. Ever. This, their large version of this is 48 square feet. They make the claim that they can put 33 adults in there. 33 adults in 48 square feet. That's packing them in. Where's the bathroom? No bathroom. Where's the ADA accessible bathroom? None. Where's the ventilation? None. Where's the fire separation? None. And they make the claim that they meet the ICC 500. It's got wheels. Wheels. You want to minimize the shelter, the, the, the openings in the, in the shelter, the envelope of the shelter, because they're expensive. Don't care what it is, they're expensive. And they're hard to deal with, quite frankly. They really are. This is, a, this is a mistake, and I mentioned this earlier with the guy that was 6,000 square feet short. There's two ways to figure occupancy in a shelter. Now, when we're designing, as designers, and we're doing our schematic design, we're trying to figure out how much space we got to do for a shelter, do we know exactly how much furniture is going to be in the shelter, exactly how many cabinets, exactly how much the floor space that columns are going to take up and all that stuff. We don't know that. We don't know it. And even at the end, typically we, we may not know exactly how much furniture the owner is going to put in there. So the code allows you to apply a usability factor. And there's three factors. There's a 50 percent, there's a 65 percent, and there's an 85 percent. And basically the reduction factor. So you're taking the gross area and you're saying, I'm going to use this as a classroom. So I got furniture, I got cabinets, I got walls, I got structure that I got to deal with. And instead of trying to figure out the net of all that, you just apply a usability factor. Look at chapter two in the ICC 500. There's definitions for these. Please understand what those, what those definitions are so you can apply the right factor. The guy that had the problem figured 85% on everything. And he was wrong. And he was flat wrong. Classrooms, bathrooms, corridors, stairwells, he figured 85% on everything. And he was 6,000 square feet short. Now, the other way to do it is to figure the absolute net. You take the net of a room, Minus all the furniture, all the cabinets, all that stuff in there. Then you can calculate, divide that by five, and away you go. Five, is, five square feet per occupant is, is the base. Don't get caught. Make sure you understand what you're looking at. 6,000 square feet at the end of the job is a pretty tough pill to swallow. And my God, the, I, you know, I can only hope and pray that they're going to pack kids in there and, and they can get where they need to be. But it's not going to meet, meet the code at all. Protective devices should be on the protected side of the shelter. Don't hang shrouds and stuff off the outside of the building. Because now you got to deal with, you know, a car flinging by that rips the shroud off because it wasn't designed to withstand those impacts trying to tear it off the wall, put them on the inside. Let them protect the opening and let them do that job, but keep it on the inside. Don't force people to go out 
and close shutters or do anything like that. Same issue of, you know, having a separated shelter. You know, you don't want somebody going out and, oh, I got, you know, baseball size hail out there, but I gotta go outside and close the shelter, so I'm gonna pop my umbrella. Doesn't work in that size of hail, believe me. And so what happens? They don't get closed. Don't get closed, now you don't have a shelter. Panic devices. This is a shelter that Shauna reviewed here uh, a couple months ago. Big, uh, it's a, that was a middle school, right, Shauna? Where are you? Uh, middle school, they did a competition gym, support areas, um, support areas, concession stand, and then locker rooms. And what you see in the red there is, is what they use their tornado, as their tornado shelter. Right off the bat, saw a problem. Right off the bat. Anybody see what the problem is? They got panic devices on the outside of the doors because that's the direction of travel, right? When you design a shelter, you have to assume the host building's gone. So what was once interior is now going to be exterior. And you have to look at it that way. Because you can't guarantee that building's going to be, that host building is going to be there. Don't count on the host building protecting your shelter. Ain't going to work. And this is a big problem for them. You know, what does the code say about how much force we, uh, that we have to, to keep down on the, the panic devices for them to operate? Per ADA, five pounds, right? Five pounds of pressure to unlatch a door, exit door. I calculated in a 250 mile an hour wind, the area of the, of the push bar that you push on, the wind alone will, ex will, will put 96 pounds of pressure on that device. 96, designed for five. Is it gonna stay closed? No, it's not. Doors are gonna open up, guess what? Don't have a shelter anymore. I'd hate to be, I'd hate to be the people that are sitting right here. Because they ain't gonna make it. And look where he's at. I mean, we're at 95%. He's exiting. Let me back up here. You can see he's exiting his gym, part of his gym out of there. 95%, how do you fix that? Ooh. Rule of thumb is never exit the host, host building through your shelter. If you don't do that, then you won't get caught with that situation. Don't exit the host building through the shelter. Masonry shelter, say it's a masonry shelter, storm shelter, problem, yeah. Can't use double egress doors on them. Don't exit the host building through the shelter. Panic device is on the unprotected side of the shelter. It'll open up and you don't have a shelter anymore. Back to question that was back there. Any openings, any openings greater than three and a half square inches, two and a sixteenth inch diameter through the shelter wall is considered an opening. Doesn't matter what you got going through it, pipe, whatever, it's considered an opening, you gotta protect it. This, uh, that node ought to show up on every single mechanical, plumbing, and electrical drawing that's associated with the shelter. Why? So what, what's in, in our sets of drawings, what discipline is mostly diagrammatic? Doesn't show you exactly how to do things, Mostly diagrammatic, electrical, right? Got nice arrows, go that way, go this way. Doesn't show you where the conduit's running though. We allow that to happen out in the field, right? Contractors want to cut a hole like this and run all these three quarter inch conduit through it. And then go, well, uh, I got to protect that? Well, I don't, I don't know, where'd you tell me that? 
make sure that note shows up on every single drawing discipline that has anything to do with the shelter. Then there's no excuses for that. They understand what they're getting into. Very few off the shelf things. Opening protective devices other than doors or windows that are tested is the responsibility of the structural engineer. If your structural engineer refuses to do it, get another structural engineer. This is not something to leave for the mechanical engineer because he doesn't know squat, with all due respect, doesn't know squat about how to protect an opening, how to anchor something onto a wall that doesn't get blown off in a 250 mile an hour wind. They don't know it. They know stitch screws. They're good with stitch screws. That's a structural engineer's issue. And they need to design it. Period. Period. If you use, uh, you have two choices on ventilation, mechanical and natural ventilation. If you use mechanical ventilation, you have to protect the air handler, you got to protect the duct work, you got to protect the backup power device for that, all as if they were shelter occupants. So if I put a big rooftop unit or air handler somewhere, I got to protect it, I got to protect the air, the, the path from that unit into the shelter, I got to protect, uh, assuming that all that's protected, I don't necessarily have to protect that opening. If I got a backup generator running that, I got to protect the generator to make sure it doesn't get blown away to supply the supplying that that uh, air or that uh, air handler with power. It gets pretty expensive, but understand that you have to protect that entire system. You got to understand the human factors of shelters. I hear so many people say, you know, I don't understand why we got to put toilets. I don't understand why we got to put air. I don't understand why we got to put lights. I don't understand that stuff. This is a structural problem. That's all I want to deal with. Now, the, the, the problem is this, the flight problem. We all deal with pressure, uh, uh, situations differently, stress differently. Some people you know, want to fight. Some people crawl in a corner and suck their thumb. Some people want to leave. And the last thing you want is somebody freaking out because they're claustrophobic or I had to go to the bathroom before I come into the shelter and two hours later I can't hold it anymore, I gotta go. And they head to the door and they open up the door at the wrong time. It's happened, I'm not making this up. In a hurricane, guy's in a hurricane shelter. Has a nicotine fit. I gotta go out and have a smoke. The eye of the hurricane is about 20 minutes away Nice strong winds that they're dealing with. He opens up the door, wind catches the door and almost rips it off the hinges. That's a problem. And that's what you're dealing with with the human factors. That's why we have water. That's why we have light. You close up a shelter, shut the lights off, you're not seeing this, literally. I mean, it gets dark. People don't like that very well. I, I don't like that well at all. I'm sure a lot of you, that you can't see your hand in front of your face, it gets a little, little uh, unnerving. All those factors are important to the success of a shelter. All of them. You're trying to create a level of comfort. Not 72 degrees and spa-like. I mean, you're just trying to, trying to get it to where you're keeping people calm. That's, that's what it boils down to, keeping people calm. Don't use my Miami-Dade County stuff. If it says Miami-Dade County, it will not work on a shelter. Promise you. I'm going to show you a video, quick video here of three doors that were tested. First one's for hurricane, same door for tornado. The third test is a residential metal door that you might go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy. And the fourth one's a tornado shelter test. This is the hurricane. Nine pound two by four at 35 miles an hour. Psst. Here's the same door with the tornado impact. Same door. 
Yeah. It says Miami-Dade County on it. It won't work. It won't work. And, he, and here, <laughs> the dummy's going to have a bad day. <laughs> That's your residential door. I like butter. Scary. And finally, the, the tornado impact. Just think about what you just saw. And here's for a tornado door. Doinks it pretty good, but it doesn't come in. And the door stays right where it needs to be. You need to understand that. No Miami-Dade County stuff. Don't cheat the shelter occupants. Just don't do it. This is a shelter that just absolutely chaps my hide, puts a burr under my saddle, whatever redneck phrase you want to use. It upsets me because there is nothing about this that's a shelter. Not, well, let me back up. It has a bathroom. It's got a bathroom, so at least half of the shelter meets that. It's got windows that are unprotected. It's got doors that are unprotected. It's got the two-story question. That, it's got two stories above it. It's not separated. It, it's a huge problem. And because the architect said storm shelter and said rooms A101B and 101C are also storm shelters. Also, the what? Where's the, all, to this? Don't do it. People are going to die in that shelter. If it gets hit, people are going to die. Makes me mad because I help pay for that through tax money. It's a dorm, it was a dorm addition at a, at a major university in Kansas. Don't use corridors only as we talk. Too many doors. Those doors used all the time. If you use them all the time, more than likely, one of those, the hardware is going to get messed up. Something's not going to work when it needs to. So don't do it. They're, and they're expensive. Don't use required restrooms for calculation. This was a lecture hall on a, on a uh, uh, high school, new addition. Uh, and they had toilets both here and here. This toilet, they said, went through the calculations did all the calculations right, they're putting five people in a required, in a required toilet. So, what happens when somebody out here has to go to the bathroom? So you move five people out and you move one person in and now your main part of your shelter is four occupants short of where it needs to be. Don't use them. I see it all the time. People want to, see, this is five. I've seen people put 11, 12 people in a bathroom like that, and you go, you got to be kidding me. I mean, you got to be awful friendly with people to go into a bathroom like this and say, hey, I need to get over there. And, you know, don't hang out stuff off the shelter that we talked about a little bit earlier. Don't share the roof structure. Don't plan on retrofitting buildings. You don't know how they were built, what materials were used, what changes were out in the field. Just don't, just don't you can't do it. Uh, it. There's big talk about, you know, let's, let's up buildings that are existing up to an F3. Just don't, don't do it. Just don't do it. Vertical impacts from neighboring structures. You got a four-story structure right next to your tornado shelter, the single floor. A lot of stuff may fall down from that big building, fall onto your, your shelter. You may want to think about siting it differently or structural has to take into account the impact of that of stuff falling off of that higher structure onto your building. Here's, a, here's one we just received uh, last week, last Friday. Uh, this is a EOC and uh, 911 dispatch and EOC in, in Texas said, hey, we need to have you look at this. You know, first thing I do is you got a microwave tower right next to your shelter. 
microwave tower is going to come down, fall on top of the shelter, you need to take in the, that into account. I haven't even reviewed it. I was just I was looking to price it, as a matter of fact, and found that out. Uh, don't ignore wind load. Wind load is almost always going to be the, the driving factor of the design of a shelter. Almost always. 99.9% .9 of the time. Don't get caught doing this. This is in the FEMA 361. Uh, it's samples of walls that have been tested. Uh, here's a blow up of that. Of that. See three masonry walls. Six inch uh, or eight inch, six inch, six inch. Bars in every cell, number four in every cell. Most of the time when you see stuff like this, it's been tested for debris impact. Missile impact only. I have seen structural engineers that didn't want to do their job because they didn't not getting paid for it. And they said, went to this and go, oh look, I just gotta put number four in each cell <coughs> on six inch block. And I'm done because it's been tested. It's only been tested for debris. If you pro most generally, if you have anything less than 12 inch CMU on the exterior side part of your shelter on the envelope, you're probably wrong. Unless you're down to maybe an eight by eight shelter. I've seen varying uh, uh, degrees of reinforcing. We always put two number fives in ours. Uh, we're reviewing one right now that's got one number eight in every cell. So that, that varies. But don't get caught with this. Don't let your structural engineers say, oh, this is all I got to do. That's a problem. Don't create internal debris. You're hanging stuff. Uh, basketball goals is really a big deal. Uh, duct work, lights. You don't want that stuff. You don't want the shelter shaking and that stuff falling down on, on your occupant's heads. You know, all your, your, your uh, devices that are holding those up, the anchors should be in shear, not in pull out, especially with concrete, if you've got a concrete deck. Steel's a little bit easier to deal with, but don't let that stuff fall down. Don't run hazardous lines, gas lines through your shelter, natural gas lines, any hazardous lines like that, steam lines, hot water lines can be a problem with some systems that the boiler's running all year long. If you do, you gotta have a remote, uh, some way to cut off that supply remotely. Because what's gonna happen is those lines are gonna break right at the wall. And now you don't want gas or you don't want hot water, you don't pour it into your shelter. You go out here and remotely stop it. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can do it with an electronic solenoid valve you lose power, which you're almost always going to lose power unless you got a backup generator, you're going to lose power, closes the valve. Uh, another way coming out of the earthquake side of things, they have uh, excess flow valves. Uh, you know, when, when stuff starts going freely, shuts it off. So if you have to do it, you got you to be able to stop that some way, somehow. In the end, do whatever it takes whatever it takes for you to go, I want to do this right, I'm going to do whatever I can to learn about this, because people's lives depend on it. Maybe your spouse, maybe your child, maybe your friends, maybe your parents, but their lives may depend on what you design. Remember that. So with that, I'm open to questions. A lot of information. I held you a little bit long. A lot of information.